Yeah. Uh, Patrick, you got bumped. I don't know why. Okay. I'm yeah. here. Uh, you're live and recording now. Okay, we're here. Um, I'm going to give a, just a minute or so for people to join. Um, is this a live chat, John? It is live, yes. And there are two people in the active in the room, but I don't know. I don't think that's limited to who can see this. So I'm just giving it a moment because people are still filling in. Are people going to ask questions? Uh, yes, they can in the chat. Yeah. Okay. All right, why don't we go ahead and start. My, my name is John Cohen. I'm a senior correspondent with Science Magazine, and I am going to moderate a discussion with Peter Marks, who's the head of the U.S. Food and Drug Administration's uh, Center for Biologics and Evaluation, which is the unit that um, regulates and approves vaccines, and Patrick Sun Chiang, who's the head of NatWorks and has several uh, biotech companies that work on different aspects of different diseases, but has been working um, hard to develop um, several different COVID-19 vaccines that are in various stages of development. So thank you both for joining me. And the three of us have spoken uh, for a long time, um, in, but not together uh, in a public setting ever. Um, and so you'll see that some of what we discuss, we're familiar with topics and we'll try to keep it at a level that everyone can understand it because the three of us can be very nerdy and dive into things that are uh, that, that lose larger audiences. Let me put it that way. I, I want to just start. We're going we're to focus on vaccines because I think that really has been the central um, biomedical tool in responding to this um, pandemic that both Patrick and Peter have been very involved with. And and, and just backing up and looking at this, I want to just say from the outset that it wasn't a given that there would be a vaccine. And I think people get a little arrogant about that at this point in time. And, and Peter was ex extremely involved with a major effort by the U.S. government to speed the development um, and the research into vaccines. And Peter, I, I'm wondering when you started, and Peter was one of the architects of Operation Warp Speed, which had a budget of uh, around $12 billion, if I'm not mistaken. And I, and I wonder, when you started this, Peter, did you think there would be a vaccine in, a, in, in the time frame that it occurred? Did you even think that there would be a vaccine? Yeah, I, I, I think it's fair to say that we were very hopeful. Um, but if you would have asked me it, how long it was going to take, I, I, was, I was recently confident eventually we'd have a vaccine, but we set a pretty, a pretty ambitious goal of having a vaccine uh, that we could deploy within uh, less than a year. Um, and I, I probably, at the time, somewhere I probably have it written down, I, I might have thought that there was a, a, a you know, I thought our, our, our probability of success was better than 50-50, but it was certainly, <laughs> I, I don't think I would have certainly put it uh, higher, than, uh, higher than 90%. So it was somewhere... It was that we were going to get there, I hoped, but um, uh, we were certainly, it was certainly not a certainty, especially mm. in that time frame. Well, what do you think, Patrick? You, with regards to the possibility? Look yeah, at, yeah. And, and when did you, when did you first decide to um, throw your lot in and try and make one? Well, we were developing vaccines with regard to cancer and uh, vaccines in um, Zika and HIV pre-COVID. Uh, using our uh, anno construct, but uh, that approach was to actually uh, address T cells, you know, especially in cancer, and address both the innate and adaptive immune system. So when uh, Operation Warp Speed started, uh, I, like Peter, was hopeful that in fact such a vaccine could be developed because the work had been done prior to COVID. A lot of work had been done in advancing uh, vaccinology uh, at that stage. So Peter had an idea early on that I think has been lost to history, and I want to bring it up because it takes us to the present. We have, by my count, about two dozen vaccines in use around the world. Do both of you have about the same rough 
count of the number now being used. Is that about right? Somewhere in that realm. And it's very difficult to compare and contrast them and how well they work. Um, Peter had an idea early on that he advocated that didn't happen, which was to do head-to-head -head comparisons in the monkey model of, uh, of the leading candidates. And I'm, I'm wondering whether you think we'd be better off if we had those data now and whether we may even want to still do that sort of head-to-head -head comparison today to help us figure out how to best use all these different vaccines in various combinations. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I would say that, you know, it was an idea, it would have been, it would have been expensive, it would have had to run in parallel, the idea was to do it in parallel with the clinical trials, it wasn't to slow things down, just so people understand, it yeah. was to be able to potentially uh, down select from multiple candidates, um, uh, when we got a little further on in the process. Um, but it takes courage to do that, right? Because you have to believe you have to be be willing to know that some things are going to be better than others, right? I, I, uh, because that's basically taking an approach that all my children were perhaps not created equal, um, uh, and, um, and picking one and moving forward with it. And so I think there was um, that that's always a challenge when working with um, when working with uh, commercial sponsors, um, and I think there was some challenges here with that. But I mean, I I I, I, I it, it it's it does seem to have some potential. Might have had some potential merit in that you would have taken you would have taken uh, the best uh, uh, that came through forward. Now some might say, well, maybe you wouldn't have known because you would have. And maybe that you didn't have human data and, and, and it wouldn't have said as well. So I, I can't say I can't argue definitively that that would have been the right way to go. But I, it would have been nice data to have, I think. What, what do you think, Patrick? You you had subjected one of your early vaccines to the monkey model and evaluated it. Well, I, I was very excited when Peter started Operation Wall Street, because I think exactly right. It takes courage to say um, you, you need to put forth all your children because this was the first opportunity to do a challenge. And, the, and I think that was one of the most important things to actually do a challenge because not only prevention of infection, but prevention of transmission. And it, to my mind, the most important thing with regard to that NHP study was to look at the viral load after a very potent challenge and um, the NIH and body, and, and this would be then therefore be completely independent where you did nothing else but submitted your vaccine and with having no control of the experiment, a, a standardized experiment across the board and measure the viral load in the nose and lungs. I, I, I still to this day think, I mean, as you know, after was thinking about human challenges, but, but this was at least a prelude to knowing what you would then down select to take in parallel. It didn't mean that whatever you saw in NHP would translate to humans, but give you the closest model to a challenge. So I think that was a really important, and I, I, we participated, we submitted, um, we participated in the challenge, and it is very beneficial to me because we demonstrated um, that we were able to completely not detect viral load, and I think that's important for transmission. So I think um, I would agree this is still an ongoing model that would be helpful. One of the things that I find most confusing as a reporter covering this is trying to explain to people why the first vaccines were uh, uh, authorized, um, you know, exactly what was being measured. And I think there's been a great deal of confusion because of their remarkable success at 95% efficacy, which led people, many people to think, oh, these vaccines prevent transmission, which those data didn't address. And it also led many people to take their eyes off the ball of preventing severe disease and death, which is really what we need the vaccines to do most. I'm curious how you view this, Peter, and that public <clears throat> messaging that's become so fraught with confusion here. Yeah, I mean, I, I think part of this is a is a fundamental misunderstanding of kind of how vaccines uh, work in the first place. But this is this is not for just COVID-19 vaccines. This is the hierarchy of 
what vaccines do. Vaccines generally, they do their best at, protect, at protecting us against the most serious outcomes. They do less well against uh, the, the moderate outcomes. And transmission is something that some vaccines do a good job at preventing, others don't. You know, I mean, we, we know, and we know that's the quality, that has something to do about the quality of the vaccine. Uh, and there's a trade-off there. For instance, the old-fashioned pertussis vaccine, whole, uh, whole kill pertussis, was very good at preventing both disease and transmission. The newer vaccine isn't, uh, but we use the newer vaccine because it causes less side effects and kids are more likely to get it. Um, so um, I do think that uh, we didn't do a good job communicating that. I think in some ways, um, in some ways it may have been that at the end of this sprint, we were so grateful to have something that was actually working um, that um, all the nuances of communicating that, look, this is going to prevent you from having uh, severe outcomes. But, you know, if you don't want to get COVID at all, you're still going to have to take some uh, some uh, mild pre precautions here or uh, or or communicating that it, it would only reduce uh, transmission by uh, at 60 or 70 percent. You know, we, we didn't do a great job with that. And, and so I think one of the problems also is the ease of which we measure antibody responses versus the other major arm of the immune system, which is T cells. And just as a, a brief overview for people, antibodies primarily stop the virus from getting into cells. And T cells primarily mop up when the antibodies fail and get rid of in, the infected cells. And Patrick, you focused a great deal on T cells. Do you think they've been given enough attention here? <laughs> That's a loaded question, John. <laughs> I know what you think. <laughs> that, uh, sadly, uh, is, is, is not. But I think people are coming around to it, which is what I'm very grateful for. And there's many, many papers now. I think, uh, as Peter said, it, it's really the hierarchy of actually the history of development of vaccines. Um, but when you start developing a vaccine with regard to, example, cancer, you begin to understand evolution in mutations. And these viruses would mutate and therefore they mutate so they, they can get in. My fear with regard to COVID is a very different virus because it gets into the ACE2 receptor, which is in the blood vessel of every part of your body. So when I say, you know, COVID is like cancer, uh, my fear is once it gets in, then you really need to find a way to clean it up and reduce the viral load itself, i.e. clean and kill the infected cell. And our body has designed, reborn our evolution of humanity has been born with what we call this natural killer cell in a T cell. It's what I call the first responder. It's been here for mil hundreds of millions of years in evolution. So the idea is if you can design a vaccine that gives you both, i.e. antibodies, but more importantly, T cells that can clean it up. And more importantly, T cells to the part of the virus that is continuously conserved. It can't really mutate. If it does mutate, it reduces its ability to replicate. So that was the strategy that we took. Um, and I'm happy to say, you know, we persist in that vein. And we are now seeing T cells in our phase one patients that received our, our, our vaccine. And that's why I think so important now this, the, the, the discussion now should go from we've done a great job in preventing death, no question. The first generation vaccines have done a great job. However, we need to reduce this viral load and prevent transmission because long COVID is a real issue. Five to 10 years from now, we're going to have to ask ourselves what's going on now with cardiomyopathy. The paper just came out in JAMA today. Uh, one year later, a huge percentage of patients have cardiac disease. What's that going to do to not only the cost of healthcare, but how we as a human race, um, I'm now seeing young people with strokes. So this inflammatory reaction with viruses that continue to persist is something I think we need to address beyond even transmission. How do we kill and reduce the viral load? Very much like HIV, which is latent. Well, Peter, how, you've, you've looked at um, several vaccine submissions for authorization closely. How much T cell data have you had to look at it? Has there been much? <laughs> um, uh, let me just say that you can tell without without divulging anything, you can tell from our public reviews. Um, uh, how much have we said about T cell mediated immunity in our public reviews? Very little. 
um, because there's not been, I mean, this has been, essentially we're, uh, we're basically like carpenters handed a hammer and a nail. Um, we, and uh, so the B cell is the nail and we're gonna be hammering on the B cell right now. Um, uh, we could use some screws, which might be uh, the, uh, uh, the T cells and we just don't, we just don't have them right now. Um, it's actually a good analogy because, you know, nails come out more easily. You know, screws which stay in more uh, longer are more like uh, T cells, which provide us with a longer lasting immunity. Um, so um, uh, it's, uh, if you want to get nerdy, we'll get a little nerdy here. Um, I know. Um, but um, that's, that's, we, we have not understood. I mean, that, that's been the issue. Here we are. When you think about it, when we authorized these vaccines, it really was, it, it, it was on the basis of what we understood with antibody responses. Now, here we are a year later, and we're really starting to understand uh, the nuance in the T cell responses and how important they are. So it's, uh, it, I think this has been a learn as you go um, uh, and, and I think it's appreciated now that it is a combination of both antibody responses and T cell responses. Um, uh, it may be, the truth is that in younger people, it's almost more important to understand uh, those T cell responses because that may be predictive of the duration of immunity. As people get older, it may be that the T cell responses are, are correlating a little less well and, and the antibody responses are what are um, are, are what are correlating with protection, but we'll see if that holds up with further study. There's, there's something interesting about Omicron too, where we see that it evades antibodies, and yet we also see protection against severe disease and death. So how do you explain it? <laughs> you know, it's not magic. What's going on? You know, and I think one of the things that I, I know Patrick's been interested in is. Vaccine manufacturers have long said, and people who run clinical trials, we can't easily measure T cells. So don't expect us to do this in a clinical trial. Don't. It's not. It's not fair to want those data. Patrick, you don't. You don't agree with that, do you? No, I don't. And and, and without being rude, um, Peter, my next title of the protocol, I'm going to say, "Screw you, vaccine COVID." <laughs> 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 We nailed you. Now we're going to screw you. So instead of nails, I'm going to bring screws to the fight. <laughs> uh, having said that, look, the interferon assay, uh, which has been de developed for um, TB, uh, quantiferon, sorry, uh, we've developed what we call an interferon assay. So you can scale this now where we can measure gamma interferon. Um, you know, the LE spot is very difficult to do. I Hang on, let me, let me stop you. I think you might lose people. The, the, T cell, the T cell response is driven by biochemicals, by interferons and by gamma interferon. So that's a, a surrogate way to look at T cells rather than analyzing the number of T cells and their ability to recognize an infected SARS-CoV-2 um, cell, which is a very difficult assay. But you're talking about a simpler way to go about yeah. measuring yeah, T cells. So, yeah, as that proxy to measure T cells, you can do... And we have done, by the way, in our phase one, the early spots in these patients, and we see N and S specific T cells, which is very encouraging, which says you have generated these T cells. And we know from SARS CoV 1, when T cells occur, there's memory up to 17 years. So that is why this is so important. And then finally, you have now seen this cross reactive T cells that you may have had some other coronaviruses. And then, and then what's important is the T cell impetus. I'm not going to get too nerdy, but the ability to have enough. T cells that are what you call um, uh, polyfunctional and you know, T cells are driving to them. The test, however, is there's a quiet gen test out there now that you actually can measure uh, um, gamma interferon from T cells. So you can take just very much like we take an antibody test, you take the serum, and you can measure the antibodies, you can measure gamma interferon. And then you can have a subset where you can take 50 patients or 50 subjects and measure the early spots and confirm. Uh, so these tests are now available. Um, and for scalability. Well, one, so I think both antibody, but you need both. Um, you need both the antibodies and you need the T-cells. But one of the really pressing questions for a regulator like the FDA is how do we get to next generation vaccines? Can we still run efficacy trials with the placebo group? Well, of course, there's an ethical dilemma 
because you can't use a placebo any longer. So what what are going to be the measures now? So 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 I think now you understand. Now I think it, it's why now understanding T cells is really critical because when you could run a when you can run a placebo controlled trial, um, you know it, you were running on clinical endpoints, um, and yeah, it was nice to understand antibody levels. But at the end of the day, it was how many people got COVID or didn't get COVID, and how many severe cases or not severe cases did you have. Now that we're talking about having to develop things with immunobridging approaches, um, if all you can do is use antibodies, you could be in a very weird place because you could imagine that there could be some vaccines that could give you very high antibody titers very quickly for a very short period of time without actually triggering enough T cell mediated immunity to give you true durable protection. So we really have to be able to start to measure both components. Um, and I think part of this is one of these challenges is that when you deal with T cell mediated immunity, you're actually having to deal with something that's not as simple to assay. It, that, that's the nice thing about antibodies is automated assays, high throughput, et cetera. But with robots today, there's no reason why we can't do uh, uh, T cell assays in a much more efficient manner as well. So Peter, I'm going to put your feet to the fire. Where is the FDA guideline telling Patrick and other people making vaccines, here's what we want to see from you in order to bridge from what we know from clinical trials into your potential product? Yeah, I, 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 you know, I, I don't mind having my feet on the fire here. We, we need to understand first what we are actually going to ask for. And I think we don't yet have a good enough understanding of what we need to ask for. But Patrick, if you have a, I, I'd love to ask you, what, what should we be asking for? <laughs> no, I, no, thank you, Peter. Honestly, I, I, and it's a very serious question, right? Because what you should be asking for, you're completely right about the antibody being up and spiking and going away. There now is um, a, an assay that can actually measure the memory B cell, which actually gives you some indication that if you have a big spike of antibodies and a memory B cell, there's a good chance you have a prolonged antibody because that B cell will go into the bone marrow. That's one. And that's stopping you, know, you for a moment. B cells make antibodies, just so we're not losing anyone. Sorry about that. Yes, yeah, yeah. so we get geeky here. The B cells make the antibodies. So that addresses one of the questions, which is a valid question of yours, because, you know, short term spikes. On the other hand, if you have a primary endpoint of the antibodies, so that everybody is comfortable um, in the correlates, because we know the antibodies will protect, but then have a secondary endpoint or, or co-primary endpoint, if it can, that can be done, of the presence of T cells, and more importantly, CD4 and CD8 T cells. Um, the, the, both of them, there's two different types of T cells, and the CD4 and CD8 went together, gives you the main T cell. So there is a way of actually doing what we call correlative protection. So you would take, let's say, any approved vaccine today out there in the market and do a head-to-head -head study in a non-inferiority or superiority analysis and compare with statistical power, whether you have these equivalents or superior, get that under emergency use approval and get a commitment to continue that whole thing because over time you look at infectivity and death, et cetera, but you can't do that in a placebo setting ethically today. So one of my hopes is to generate what we call a universal COVID vaccine um, independent of the platform, I don't care, that generates these T cells, which means you need to take different platforms, a DNA platform, an RNA platform, subunit platform, an adjuvant platform, and run them one at a time and look at the data, and the data should speak, and then get that out into the market, very much what's out there now, and allow them the, the, the ongoing data, commitment from the pharmaceutical company, to choose any of those platforms and whatever works works. I think the challenge is um, companies are now sort of said, well, you know, COVID's done. There's not enough market left, et cetera. But we are still seeing, you know, 1,900 deaths a day in the United States. So I, I, I don't think we can walk away and, and say we, we're done, we're not done. And so that is, you know, I... I the wish that I would have is let's put head-to-head -head data, T um, antibodies, T cells, and just measure them 
you, the good news about that, you get an answer quickly. You get an answer in three to six months. So, and you can afford this study. You do 600 patients, 600 patients, and you do 1,500 for safety. Uh, and then you, you have data in front of you. That sounds great, Patrick. Who's paying for it? Nobody's organized that head-to-head study. Is there a financial incentive? You have a company. Do you have a financial incentive to do these? Who's going to pay for it? I will pay for it. We will pay for it. There's not an issue of financial incentive now. It's an issue of really what we're facing humanity. And that's why I focus my efforts in Africa. I know it's less than 11% of Africans uh, within the continent of Africa. And the death rate is enormous. As you talked about in Hong Kong, uh, the, the elderly are not. So, because I want to go beyond that. Because after you've gotten that vaccine, the next thing is to get what they call T-cell diversity. And I want to take IL-15, which is, I don't get geeky, but it will upregulate these T-cells. So, so this is an ongoing evolution to truly try and find what they call the universal vaccine for pandemic preparedness. The answer is we're not going to ask the government for what we haven't received. Uh, we would love to have received, but have not. But we would be willing to finance this um, because this is important. Well, Peter, it, it still strikes me that for vaccine manufacturers, they rely on your guidances that, you know, I've read them. They're extremely detailed, what F- FDA expects. And if you don't tell them your expectations, they're not going to. I mean, Patrick is an outlier. He may come to you with things that you're happy to receive. But it seems to me the FDA would benefit and we'd all benefit from knowing what, what we're all discussing here today, that these are the things you'd like to see. Yeah, no, that point's all well taken. Again, we have to, we have to under, when, when we put something in guidance, we have to understand enough what we're asking for. We, you, it, it wouldn't shock me if you were to see updated guidance in the not too distant future. But before we, we, the reason why you might not have seen it already is it did take a little time to understand. I mean, if you look over the past the, 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 the rate of publication of, of I got to get my finger to the right place, t- papers about T cells and COVID-19 were like really at the bottom of the screen. And now suddenly over the past few months, they've just taken off. Um, and so now there's actually something that one can actually say before it was more it was more of first principles. Now it's actually data based. And when we have stuff that's data based, that's when we can actually uh, put stuff into guidance. Well, just to help reduce the shock that we're going to experience, should we expect this in a week or a month or in six months? Uh, uh, you know, uh, let's put it this way. It's it's in the foreseeable future. That's as far as I can say. As a, uh, as a, as a, a true government bureaucrat. <laughs> Yeah, well, I, I can't have our I can't have our attorneys come and uh, and take me away. I, yeah, but I, in all I, seriousness, it's a difficult thing for you to put a guidance out about. Right, it, it's 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 challenging to put a guidance out about this because we have to be speaking about something that we are convinced that the science is is robust enough uh, that um, that we can tell various manufacturers to follow this. Um, the good news is one th- good thing that has come from COVID, uh, John, is that. We, we no longer take forever to get out guidance. We have gotten out guidance during COVID um, uh, from putting pen to paper uh, to having it issued in about two weeks when necessary. So that has actually been a really good thing. Um, just so that people who might not be familiar with the FDA guidance process, um, sometimes it has taken us years to get out guidance. So the idea that we can speed that up is, is really exciting to me. And it's something that will continue post COVID. So the good news is once we have a good sense of what we're looking for here from T cells, it's not like it's going to take us years to get it out there. It's it's a matter of weeks to months uh, before something gets out. Peter, if I could just embellish on the question of independent of the guidance, I think it's now well established gamma interferon is a real proxy of T cell activation. And then if you take an S and N that activates a T cell, it's a good proxy to specific T cell that is recognizing the, the COVID vaccine. So therefore it's a very straightforward, in my mind, scientific data point to take, let's say a, a, a modified RNA vaccine or add no current vaccine and measure those T cells, not only um, with the interferon and then have a subset where you actually do the whole early spot where you can actually separate the two different t-cell subtypes and on the one hand find uh, 
little or some, and the other hand find a huge amount. Um, and really one can do a very real statistical analysis just on, the, on, on those two tests. Um, we initially thought even, frankly, being very bold to come to the FDA and said, we want to just to generate a T-cell vaccine. Don't even measure our antibodies. Um, that was too long, too far in, in 2020, as uh, we've had those discussions. But now we have an ability to get the, both the antibodies and the T-cells because it's often you do what you call heterologous, where you take the mRNA and you take the DNA and, and I'm in, independent of the platform. All you want is antibodies and T-cells. So I'm encouraged um, by, by this discussion, and I think you know. I think the good news is, I think the globe, uh, global global uh, um, research is also looking at it this in, in this way. Yeah, let's let's shift to the global for a moment. I think something happened uh, in the last few weeks that is uh, maybe startling to some people, and that's the the African uh, Union said, "Hey, it's not a supply issue for us right now." It's about delivery, and it's about our capacity to absorb. And the entire time until now, there's been huge vaccine inequity with supply that has prevented uh, many countries in Africa from accessing. And Patrick, you're working uh, in South Africa and Botswana um, to build capacity, which will take time, but you're, you're there doing it. How do you view this shift uh, and what does the, how does the world, I mean, because until now, there's been uh, Tedros, the director general of WHO, screaming at the top of his lungs about this inequity. But now the issue has shifted. And I, I'm curious, from an, uh, an African pr- perspective, how, how do you view it? And you're from South Africa originally and still very involved with um, that. Country. I'm very much involved. So, as you know, you may not know, but I've been invited to a hearing Congress with John, Dr. John from Africa CDC to talk about how do we address these vaccine inequities. I think there's many elements in it. One um, is unfortunately the cold chain issue. Um, and, and the way this has happened, and I would recommend people watch the BBC Panorama show that just talked about very recently about uh, these vaccine inequities and how expired drugs and they can't manage it because it's of the cold chain issue. So. We want to address that, and already we have discovered that we have a next-generation RNA that can be at room temperature. It's a huge issue with regard to Africa. The other one, obviously, is is availability. Much as you say, it's not available. Uh, I speak to leaders. Um, I've spoken to President Ramaphosa, President Masisi, the SADC, and Africa CDC. There's still not availability. And third is affordability. Um, you will hear from this program, the affordability uh, to African nations is impossible for them to pay $30 a dose of the vaccine. So, and finally, really, really, at the end of the day, can you have an effective vaccine that can prevent transmission long term? So we can address cold chain, durability, broad cost, and supply chain, um, which we try to address all at once. And then ultimately give the continent's own capacity and sustainability um, and human capital. So that's the focus that we're taking now in Africa. Does FDA play a role internationally other than setting standards and examples? Does it, are you involved in other countries? Uh, So we we play a, a role with WHO and with assisting other countries as we can. Uh, there's a fair amount of go between uh, between uh, FDA and the larger global regulators that is e- EMA and uh, PDMA in Japan. Um, and EMA uh, Europe. It, it, yes, that's right. Sorry, European Medicines Agency. Yeah. Right, and um, and the the uh, there are some other smaller regulators that we 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 routinely uh, uh, work with, as well as a kind of a a a group of regulators. Um, that get together that are global, um, we try to share as much information as we can. In some cases, uh, we're um, trying to help with technical assistance. um, And we're also trying to help with leadership in dealing with some of the thorny issues uh, that we're having to bump through with this. Um, And I, I, you know, it's, it's been a bumpy ride because boosters or no boosters, you know, this has been a, a, a bumpy, a bumpy path forward 
where sometimes we've been uh, not necessarily trailblazing, but we've been in the leading edge of doing certain things. And with that has come its bumps. It strikes me that FDA has also played a role internationally with side effects, which trying to figure out, are these vaccines causing yeah. harm? And by you have to gather international data because humans are humans. Right. And actually, that's something that I would like to just say that has been one of the great things that has happened during this pandemic has been a coming together of global regulators. Um, and uh, once every two weeks, there is a call. It's usually held about uh, uh, six o'clock in the morning uh, in Eastern time because we have to get the, the Australians and the New Zealand. It's, someone's always up at some weird hour. Um, uh, but we get together and we discuss, you know, for instance, for the safety signals with the mRNA vaccines, the global regulators talking about myocarditis and uh, potential deaths and or uh, uh, more serious adverse events. And, and it's been very helpful because at the end of the day, when, when you can put a denominator under something where the denominator is starting to get into hundreds of millions of people, um, uh, from diverse ethnic backgrounds, and the numerator for uh, for adverse events is you know is like handful. You start to feel better about certain things. I'm not saying that these these uh, that these vaccines are without any uh, side effects or without any potential adverse events, but at least we feel more confident uh, about certain things. Um, and certainly, some of the misinformation that has been widely distributed in the United States and that's responsible for a self-inflicted wound in the United States where we have an adequate vaccine supply, where we can afford the vaccine, and yet where we have 30, 35% of the adult uh, population that hasn't ever seen a vaccine um, uh, is uh, in their arm is, is because of this type of misinformation um, mm -hmm. that there are so many bad side effects uh, to these vaccines when at the end of the day, um, these vaccines are a I mean, no, they're not perfect, but they are a miracle. The fact that we had a vaccine within a year of, of a, a pandemic, they are a bit of a miracle. And the fact that they probably have saved um, lots and lots of lives, you know, how many thousands and thousands, I can't say, but they probably have made a difference. Yeah, um, there's something that vaccine hesitancy uh, that doesn't get discussed much, but it's the syringe itself. And I, I often speak with people about not their fear of needles, but why do I want to inject something into my body? And Patrick, you've been working on a, a potential pill vaccine, which, you know, would, would get around that question. Because like in the United States, who uses a syringe? Somebody who has diabetes, somebody who has a need for a monoclonal antibody, somebody who has an opiate addiction, but people who are healthy and have no disease that requires serious treatment or who don't have a substance issue, they look at syringes like these aren't something that you normally, especially adults, you know, we don't do this. And I wonder if this, the hesitancy would be changed by a pill vaccine. And we know with other vaccines that have been used nasally for children, the flu, flu mist or oral polio vaccine, there is a difference in acceptance and where does your pill vaccine stand and how do you view its potential to impact hesitancy? Well, the first thing was to test where the pill vaccine would actually work. And I'm happy to say that was part of the Operation Warp Speed, where we combine our sub-Q plus with the pill vaccine in those monkeys and challenge them. And what was exciting post-challenge, there was no virus detected in lungs and nose of the pill vaccine. Sub-Q is an injection. Yeah. Yes. Just clarify. Sorry about that. You're speaking doctor, so. Well, thank you for keeping me non-geeky. <laughs> uh, but what's exciting now is we have now some evidence, very exciting evidence of nasal, you know, because a different kind of immunity called mucosal immunity in your nose and lungs and a different antibody called IgA. So we won't go, go geeky there. But if you can actually have both nasal and maybe a sub Q, because I don't think you can really get any you need to really activate all parts of this immune system. So, and we are now shown preclinically uh, good protection with the sRNA nasally. So I think this is where it's going to go, where you can put a pill into the device and there's, there's things like that on the FDA approved uh, Pfizer developed 
this where you put a pill in a device and you inhale it nasally. Oh, so it's not, a, it's not an oral pill then? It's No, the one in the um, non-human prime, which is the oral pill. The challenge with the oral pill, you have the informative, so it actually protects you from the acid in the stomach. You now have another battery. <laughs> so, um, so these are all the technical issues. But a nasal, um, where you can use it in a pill form and actually give it nasally, is we will be developing mm. the problem is as you said from a pharmaceutical perspective we made the decision look we we know what perfect is i better get good before i go to perfect <laughs> and good right now is is an injection a jab okay well, I, we only have... ready wants to get t-cells if i may just go back to the question that peter talks about the fda and its help globally it's enormously important because one of the things that I recognized when I went to Africa is the absence of the ability um, of, it, there's some organizations that you not know one mentioned, but they're just in paper, not even in um, technical, uh, uh, you know, um, common technical document form. And this is where the FDA can really help to create a global standardization. Um, and I'll be talking to Peter and people at the FDA, where we're going to help try and help those nations. Because it's really important if things are going to be developed in Africa, that the standards should be not African standards or in just Chinese standards. There should be some global common standard that can manage this, not only from the safety, but also the side effects. And that's going to need the internet. That's going to need next generation technologies if we do this. I mean, this. I, I, so, so Patrick's going to get me fired up on something that I, I've already written about. But I mean, we, we for the next pandemic, you know, I hope we never have another pandemic. Um, but for the next thing that comes along, the concept that we have had to that that in, that things have been slowed down by the the, the need to rework applications, uh, so that companies have wasted time with paperwork um, instead of science. That we, we need to find a way around that for the future. We, we need to come to, com- I, I agree that we need to come to standard documents that can that can be used in these situations. Um, and that we, yes, we might sacrifice a little something, but the fact that the world will be better because of it, um, that's where we need to go. So we don't have much time left. And there's one question, I, that I'm, uh, it's a burning question to me. When we began the conversation, we talked about warp speed and the the incredible sense of urgency to solve this problem with the vaccine. And now we have lots of vaccines, but we also have the knowledge that there are loads of variants and that there are future threats. And there have been several research groups that say we can make a vaccine that works against all viruses in the SARS-related family, everything from SARS to COVID and all the bat viruses we know in between and the pangolin viruses that let's shoot for that as, I mean, ideally you want a vaccine that protects against all coronaviruses, but let's not get into the moon shot. Let's get into the, let's get from New York to Los Angeles shot and, you know, keep it kind of circumscribed. Do you feel as though there's enough of a sense of an ur- of urgency right now to, to do that, to make and evaluate a pan, what's called Sarbico virus, vaccine is there enough of a sense of urgency now to do that one or have we gone back into the mode of that well, we've been forever i I, I i i'll let i'll let um let patrick take this in a second but i i'm a little concerned that there is a certain level of pandemic fatigue and complacency that is very worrisome to me and i think if one reads the history of the previous influenza pandemic in the 1918 time frame and looks at what happened in 1919 and 1920 while things were extinguishing from that uh, that huge spike. Um, one can see what happens if we don't pay attention. So I, I am exquisitely happy that we're getting to a better place in the United States. I am very concerned about what's happening around the rest of the globe. And I'm so sorry to hear what's happening in Hong Kong um, uh, in the elderly. Um, but it shows you what happens that we have to deploy vaccines we have to have vaccination, um, uh, which is means we also have to have our communications and our sociological colleagues uh, help us make this happen. Um, but we also need to keep our research up 
uh, and our noses to the grind because I agree we need to we need to even if we don't get there we need to try to get there um, to a, a more effective vaccine. Patrick, what do you think? I couldn't have said it better, right? And Peter is exactly right. Um, and I'm concerned very much about the complacency. As we talked about it, John, this has now gone into deers, cats, dogs. The recombination opportunity of this thing now that it's in mammalians, this coronavirus, we need to really, 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 and when I talk about second generation vaccines, I'm hopeful, I'm really hopeful that the T-cell, NK-cell um, vaccine that crosses both N and S of the, these two proteins gives us at least the opportunity to get what are called this universal protection. Um, and it's really important that, 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 that we go there. And I am right. I'm worried about this sense of complaints. We're like, we done, you know, COVID's over. It's not. Yeah. Well, I think that's a perfect note to end on. Thank, thank you both for speaking candidly and, uh, and introducing the screw nail metaphor, which I, th I can see Patrick's car having a bumper sticker very soon. So uh, thank everyone for, I thank everyone for joining us as well. <laughs> thank you all. Right. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, John. Bye-bye.